Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you all so much for being here. We're so delighted to have you um, for our SICEP webinar series, and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Um, I want to note that um, this is a coordinated and collaborative effort among the cancer centers at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill Weinberger, as well as our counterparts at Duke Cancer Institute and Wake Forest Baptist. And a shout out to my colleagues, um, Ronnie and Tommy, who are my COE um, co-directors for those, or counterpart directors for those COE um, community outreach and engagement efforts at Wake Forest and Duke. Um, we are so happy to have with us today two really excellent speakers that I first met um, at a community outreach and engagement um, supplement function that the National Cancer Institute hosted. And I was just blown away by what they've been doing in the Pacific Northwest, and we thought this would be a great opportunity to hear more from them for this audience. Dr. Myra Parker is an associate professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington. Um, she is an enrolled member of three affiliated tribes in the North Dakota region. She also is director of the Seven Direction Institute, which is focused on um, public health services for indigenous communities. And um, she also is the um, uh, faculty lead for the indigenous community efforts within the COE office at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute in Washington. Um, I also want to introduce Craig D., who is the Community Health Educator for Indigenous Communities at the COE, Office of Community Outreach and Engagement, um, there at Fred Hutch. He is a member of the Navajo Nation, and he is working very closely with investigators at the University of Washington, as well as at Fred Hutch, um, to advance this work. And he is a graduate student, so we are so excited to hear about your studies as well as your research as you move along. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them um, at this time. I think right before we get started, um, I want to reintroduce everyone to the polling software again. This is the screenshot of what it'll look like, and there will be a few questions um, at the end of the presentation. So for this question, how many federally recognized tribes are in Washington State? A, 29, B, 12, C, 3, or D, 20? While you're thinking about that question, let me go over the disclosure piece real quick. This activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course director, William A. Wood, MD, MPH, in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. This, the course director and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies as defined by the AACCME. Greensboro Area Health Education Center is approved as a provider of the Nursing Continuing Professional Development by the North Carolina Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. These presenters have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And now that everyone's had a chance to think about that question, you can go to pollev.com slash UNCLCN or text UNCLCN to 22333 and go ahead and submit your answers. And how are they doing, Craig? So far, so good. I think somebody's been looking ahead. <laughs> okay, looks like we have consensus, so I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, yes, yeah, so there are 29 federally recognized tribes in Washington State. Uh, here. And I'll go ahead and advance next slide if that's okay, Andrew. Oops. All right, Yanta Bennett, good morning everyone here from Pacific Northwest. I'm, uh, let's see here, it's good afternoon in the East Coast. Uh, my name is Craig D. I I am Navajo Dine. I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself to Navajo. Uh, currently working, residing, and gaining knowledge within Duwamish and Coast Salish territories here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm a community health educator uh, for indigenous populations with the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement at Fred Hutch. Um, just want to say yeah, thank you for having uh, Meyer and I to be here to uh, share knowledge and space with you all. Uh, we're super excited to be here and thank you for this opportunity. Right. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so here's a quick overview of uh, what we'll be discussing today. Uh, I'll be quickly going over some uh, some updates about our office, as well as uh, reviewing the administrative supplement that funds our project and uh, looking into some specific games approaches of this project and looking at some early uh, results or at least some ongoing results of the um, of our project. And as far as quick update, let's see here. So. Uh, Recently, as of April 1st, our uh, Fred Hutch and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance of our cancer consortium uh, recently merged together to form the Fred Hutch and Cancer Center, so just really dropping the research uh, aspect of the name, but essentially we formed a new cancer consortium that kept the uh, that kept Seattle Children's Hospital as well as the University of Washington's uh, medicine, and so really uh, merging both Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and Fred Hutch um, kept the, the research enterprise as well as the clinical operations of Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, but at the same time keeping uh, Seattle Children's in need of medicine uh, cancer programs into, um, into the, the Greater Cancer Consortium. And let's see here. So within the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement here at Fred Hutch, uh, our mission is to reduce the cancer burden for all individuals in our catchment area, regardless of their race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, geographic residence, or any other potentially limiting factor. And we do that through uh, monitoring the cancer burden, uh, implement programs to reduce the cancer burden, utilizing uh, equitable bi-directional approach, and promote research uh, relevant to our catchment area to reduce the burden of cancer and continue to expand cancer research in high need areas beyond the catchment area. All right, and let's see here. So I want to quickly review the Cancer Center Support Grant that funds our project. Uh, so this uh, supplement provides several opportunities for the project we'll be sharing with you today. This uh, one-year supplement supports the increasing partnership between Fred Hutch and a tribal comprehensive cancer co uh, control coalition. And its purpose is to essentially um, improve partnerships and collaboration, identify priorities of cancer control, co-create projects to advance those priorities, and evaluate uh, those impacts. And essentially, our long-term goal is to increase and strengthen connections between Fred Hutch and tribal entities within Washington State. Now, on the right side is a map that illustrates where all 29 federally recognized tribes are in Washington State. And regarding background information in developing this project, there was ongoing recognition and of how COVID-19 has negatively impacted our Coast Salish relatives. This pandemic has elevated cancer health disparities where incidence mortality rates uh, for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and cervical cancer have increased and screening rates for those cancers have dramatically decreased. Uh, as mentioned before, this uh, the supplement allowed us to formally take a, a step back and see where we can make the most positive impact within a year. Uh, it was best to partner with tribal epidemiology centers. And ultimately, these tribal epidemiology centers uh, serves uh, American Indian, Alaska Native tribal and urban communities by uh, management of public health information systems, investigating these diseases of control and managing disease prevention control programs. Uh, of these 12 tribal epidemiology centers, we partnered with one that's been cultivating a well-established comprehensive cancer control program for uh, about 20 years, and they're going into their 20, I think, 21 years. And so this cancer uh, control program has built and fostered relationships within uh, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And one of the main benefits of this partnership is that it would provide potentially many opportunities for building trust and relationships between Fred Hutch the Cancer Consortium, and Washington State Tribes. Uh, by partnering with this cancer control program housed within a uh, tribal epidemiology center, we co-created a project that has, um, that has the following specific aims, uh, which is to empower communities to increase breast and colorectal cancer screening and HPV vaccinations through media campaigns, uh, implement intergenerational cancer control interventions to increase access to breast cancer screening and HPV vaccination and evaluate those impacts, such as um, 
media campaigns, a number of resources, and uh, education materials given to the community, and evaluating breast cancer screening and HPV vaccinations. So uh, thanks, Craig. Now I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, one of the things that we really benefited from was the fact that the Washington State uh, Cancer Registry had a relationship with the Northwest uh, Portland Area Indian Health Board, and um, they have had this ongoing relationship over the past oh, 15 or more years. So the Northwest uh, Portland Area Indian Health Board is one of those tribal epidemiology centers that um, Craig mentioned earlier. And uh, they're able to uh, have agreements with the tribes within Washington State so that they can confirm that um, those folks who are um, identified as uh, having cancer or um, dying from cancer are in fact American Indian uh, or members of tribes uh, from Washington State. And so that addresses one of the biggest you know, challenges with some of the um, cancer data that we're dealing with. A lot of times with American Indians and Alaska Natives, uh, the um, uh, racial or ethnic background is incorrectly identified on um, the death certificate or in the process of um, diagnosis. And so uh, that's one of the challenges that can kind of limit some of the um, reliability of the rates that we're seeing. As you can see on this slide, it shows the cancer incidence rates among American Indians and Alaska Natives in Washington State over the years from 2014 to 2018. And you can see that for breast cancer, lung cancer, and liver cancer uh, incidence rates, those are all elevated among American Indians and Alaska Natives. So we knew that um, we could rely on this data and we knew that that was a good uh, point to discuss you know, with our partners at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Uh, in addition to that, we knew that cancer mortality rates among American Indians and Alaska Natives were higher um, as compared to non-Hispanic white populations in Washington State. In particular, we knew that lung cancer breast cancer and, and liver cancer were some of the biggest um, challenges uh, for our populations that we're working with. And so um, as a result, uh, we, in accordance with this community-based participatory research model, uh, we reached out to uh, Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and there had been you know, an ongoing Kind of relationship with them, but when we heard about this opportunity to apply for this additional uh, re uh, support, we uh, wanted to make sure that we were following this model and um, really ensuring that we had a strong partnership with them that was supported um, financially as well as, you know, in terms of decision-making processes uh, and really wanted to build trust and, and show that uh, we respected, you know, their processes and um, wanted to ensure also that uh, they knew that we were uh, understanding tribal sovereignty and uh, some of the other pieces that are important in doing research among American Indian Alaska Native populations. Um, and so uh, one of those pieces in particular is uh, really recognizing community strengths. And so um, uh, in terms of the community-based participatory research principles, uh, this is one of the really important pieces of, um, you know, building those trusting relationships with communities, and in particular with tribal communities. And so, uh, because uh, Craig and I had done work with tribes in the past, uh, we knew that there were a lot of different strengths that were available to tribal communities that held the potential for a really um, strong project that we could uh, use to kind of address some of those high incidence rates and mortality rates for cancer among these populations. And so, uh, you know, in particular, we knew that uh, there are a lot of um, tribally based schools and tribal programming that could serve as uh, the basis for a potential program. We knew that many tribes had either um, received uh, 
Indian Health Service dollars to run their own tribally run health clinics or they uh, receive support through Indian Health Service to provide medical services. And we also knew that tribal leaders were concerned and are aware of these, um, these issues with cancer in their populations. Um, and we knew that there are many different community groups, including parents and grandparents and other family members who would, you know, be interested in, in uh, protecting uh, folks within their families and their communities. And so we knew that there were all of these different potential um, uh, possible strengths that we could uh, access through a particular program. And through that lens uh, came the intergenerational approach that um, we decided to take uh, in talking with the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. They had a whole host of experience in implementing many programs, not just cancer specific programming it, within their epidemiology center. And um, one of the things that they confirmed was that if we were to, you know, really ensure that it was a family centered approach where um, we could, you know, emphasize the need to support the health and well being of all family members, that that would be something that would be uh, received well among the tribal populations and partners that we were hoping to work with. So another piece of uh, the the consideration as we were developing an approach uh, with, in partnership with the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board is um, really to focus on some of those social determinants that are specific to American Indian Alaska Native communities and uh, recognizing and privileging indigenous knowledge uh, to ensure that whatever uh, program we came together to implement it would be something that um, was it congruent with indigenous cultures um, across uh, our partners. And so, you know, this graphic that you see here on the screen came out of the First Nations uh, in Canada. Uh, several years ago, they brought together uh, First Nations communities to talk about what are some of those social determinants of health that are specific to American Indian Alaska Native communities. And of course, some of them are similar to, you know, any other uh, community around the world. Uh, but in particular, there are some that, that stand out. And so uh, that connection to land uh, and connection to um, natural resources and culture is a little bit different among tribal communities. And so uh, ensuring that you know, the materials that we're developing in partnership with Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and the tribal communities that are partnering with us uh, it was really important in, in developing those materials to acknowledge that uh, the, the unique and diverse cultures that are represented uh, across uh, the partners that we're working with are respected and, and also incorporated into those materials. Um, in addition, we knew that uh, in order to um, address some of these issues, we also needed to include tribal languages if if that was a priority for that particular population. Uh, we knew that we may need to address, you know, issues of um, uh, racism and discrimination specific to, you know, some of the experiences that tribes, uh, tribal members in Washington State may have experienced when trying to access health care. And, um, and so we knew that uh, there were some particular uh, contexts that we had to adjust for and really make sure that people felt supported, that they feel welcome when we uh, implement these programs and, um, and that they feel that, um, you know, this is a, a value add instead of, you know, researchers coming in and trying to collect a lot of data and then leaving with the data and never to be seen again. Um, that has happened in the past and a lot of tribe, tribal members and tribes are sensitive to that and understand um, that, you know, there has been harm that has been perpetuated by researchers. And so that was another incentive for us to really ensure that, you know, we were ensuring a transparent process, um, that we were um, really honoring and respecting tribal sovereignty. And um, what that means then is uh, if a tribe, you know, doesn't want to partner with us, then we have no, you know, legal authority within their jurisdictions and should not you know, try to um, circumvent that or, um, you know, otherwise diminish tribal sovereignty needs. 
Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the other pieces is just kind of understanding our own positionality and Craig will speak to this as well. Uh, I may be an enrolled member of a tribe. Uh, I'm not from Washington state. Uh, and so that really doesn't give me, you know, any particular um, status at all uh, in terms of how we work with tribes in Washington state. Um, and it also, um, you know, helps me understand why tribes in Washington state might be hesitant to work with our institution at Fred Hutch or, you know, um, other partners who are, uh, you know, not necessarily um, aligned closely with some of the goals that uh, tribes may have in terms of addressing health issues within their communities. So that was also really important um, as, as a consideration moving through this project and um, identifying ways that we could be a strong partner with Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and the tribal communities that we're working with. And also to understand that our motivations, our values are not necessarily the same. Um, I've been socialized into this research realm. And, um, and so uh, I acknowledge that, you know, I may be viewing things very differently than tribal members who, you know, have maybe a history of uh, mistreatment uh, within healthcare settings who may have been harmed somehow through screening efforts in the past um, or who may be hesitant to, uh, you know, put themselves or their loved ones through, you know, some of these types of screening efforts or vaccination efforts. Um, and so we have to come with, with a lot of humility and, and really understanding, you know, are we making assumptions based on our own experiences? And, um, and if so, you know, how do we make sure that we're able to hear, you know, what the needs are and also what the concerns are of our uh, partners that we would like to work with. Um, so I'll, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Craig so you can kind of talk through, you know, some of the considerations that, that you um, had as we were approaching this partnership. Yeah, absolutely, thanks Myra. Uh, so as Myra uh, mentioned, uh, there was a need to examine our positionality as, as a research academic and clinical institution. Um, and one of the ways that we did that was a critical self-reflection. Uh, how do our personal experiences and worldviews, uh, not only as, you know, for myself as an indigenous or Navajo individual, but, you know, we are working with a, a team, a diverse team who um, does not necessarily have that experience with working with tribal communities or at least tribal uh, populations. And so uh, looking at how, helping them also recognize, um, uh, you know, their power and privilege, uh, some of their motivations and values, and do they match up with the, the community? Um, what does access to the creation of knowledge look like for them? Uh, these, some of these norms uh, that come from uh, scientific and uh, scientific di disciplines sort of perpetuates mistrust among indigenous communities. So helping the, the team at Fred Hutch recognize those kind of things because uh, when working with different populations or other populations, you know, there are considerations about, you know, some of the, the roles as researchers. However, uh, it can be slightly different or entirely different from tribe to tribe or community to community uh, within Washington state. And so uh, by recognizing that and recognizing cultural humility and uh, the power dynamics between partners in research and intervention implementation. Um, these power dynamics shift because there's a shared decision-making on a bi-directional approach, uh, which allows new research questions to be considered that come from the community uh, to benefit the community. And so looking really at that, um, seeing how, uh, you know, I may be indigenous, like Myra mentioned, uh, you know, I may be indigenous walking into, or at least having a meeting, a Zoom meeting or in-person meeting with some of these tribes or some of the community members. Um, my name as well as my positionality is still tied to the word research. And so making sure that I take that into consideration that, you know, I may be indigenous and all that, but again, research is tied to uh, my name and to some of the, the work that we want to do with tribes. However, you know, shifting that uh, thought process, that perspective uh, from my point of view is that, yeah, you know, there there are times when I need to 
check myself before going into a community or at least having a meeting with some of these uh, community partners to, um, you know, to better work with them and to build that trust and relationship and not necessarily going into, um, into these communities to extract data or extract resources. Rather, I'm there to support the community as much as possible, having that indigenous approach or a holistic worldview of uh, partnering as much as possible and making sure that we understand the strengths as well as the histories of each of the tribes uh, and communities that we work with. And in terms of, you know, uh, having a shared decision making on a bi-directional approach, uh, one of the things uh, that we did early on with the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board was that we um, we're looking at how do we uh, still uh, follow the, the guidelines of the administrative supplement? How do we still look at evidence-based interventions or implement evidence-based interventions? And uh, working closely with the Northwest Portland Area Area and Health Board, they suggested um, that um, you know very few evidence-based interventions exist uh, that have specific, specifically been developed and tested by within American Indian populations. And those that do exist uh, are not always readily accessible. And so one of the things that we uh, consider is that, um, that we create this menu of uh, intergenerational approaches to cancer screening and, uh, in a, a prevention. And basically, it's a menu of interventions that uh, have activities in HPV vaccinations, mammography, uh, screening, um, among different age groups and among different generations. And so looking at uh, education materials or uh, education interventions um, from high school students or even um, younger than that, middle school students, and all the way up to our mothers and grandmothers of the community and looking at some of the uh, activities that, um, that involve mammography screening. And so taking those and pulling those and putting this into this menu uh, sort of provides an overlook on some of the activities that have been used by tribal communities in the past, um, but it provides the opportunity for the tribes that we'll be working with to examine each of these and look at you know, some of the activities that they would like to uh, utilize and, and pull from these uh, interventions. And I think that uh, a main benefit from these, uh, I, I guess from this approach, is that it respects tribal sovereignty. Because one, it doesn't necessarily put ABIs or interventions, picking one or two interventions and having a tribal community um, shift their, uh, you know, their perspective or at least their approaches to fit within this one intervention. Rather, uh, they utilize their, their tribal sovereignty tribal sovereignty and self-determination to pull from these uh, interventions and to uh, build in interventions or at least tribal activities that would work and benefit the community. And so they would pick from uh, these interventions uh, some activities that complement their, their community. And um, basically, I think that would definitely provide some of the, I would say some of the ongoing activities um, to inform their community about breast cancer screening as well as colorectal cancer screening and HPV vaccination. Excuse me. Uh, and let's see here. So from a CBPR approach, um, we are utilizing a tribal engagement perspective. Um, and this allowed us to recognize that, um, you know, the pandemic has stressed uh, tribal health systems and populations. And so looking at uh, some of the, or at least working with uh, the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board, we realized that a lot of the tribes here in Washington State, um, unfortunately, I, I think this is a common thread uh, throughout Indian country, is that um, they're the, the staffing and the work, or at least the resources available to tribal communities are stretched thin, especially through a pandemic. And so we're seeing those lasting effects, or at least those ongoing effects of the pandemic. And so it just essentially elevated um, 
you know, some of these effects or at least some of the lack of resources and staffing for uh, some of these communities. And so ideally what the Northwest Portland and Health Board worked with us on was that we shift our focus on community strengths um, because they, what I was told by uh, one of our partners is that, you know, we had to look for ways to empower the community. Um, how do we empower the community through some of these interventions and empower this, uh, empower the community through this project? Although it's one year project, how do we start that process? How do we start working towards empowerment of these communities? Uh, next, um, yeah, and so one of the uh, ways that we do that, uh, as far as the strength goes, is providing online opportunities. So as you look there on the right side, we provided a, sort of a, a workshop environment online through Zoom to where we discuss with tribes about some of the objectives of the project, um, discuss some of the CBPR approaches or some of the uh, evidence-based interventions um, and showing them, you know, looking through the menu and providing some insight into some of the activities that are uh, within those ADIs that they can pull from, but also discussing with them what has worked within their, their communities in the past. And so I think one of the cool things that um, some of our uh, partners mentioned that aren't in those evidence-based interventions that were provided is the, the use of postcards to um, remind uh, you know, they're the community members about uh, upcoming screenings, upcoming appointments, and so forth, and utilizing that and uh, indigenizing uh, those postcards in a way that um, help engage communities a lot more, such as raffles. And so if you turn in your postcards in a by a certain amount of time, then you're entered into a raffle. Native people love raffles. I love raffles. And so, um, you know, that's a huge benefit for uh, for some of the communities that we work with. Let's see here. And then an another thing that we did was that uh, we worked with the Portland Airmen and Health Board on providing small grant uh, small grants, uh, maybe up to ten to fifteen thousand dollars each. Uh, but basically, this uh, ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollars supports tribal health programs um, through increasing community resources. So. I think one of the things that this grant has, or the supplement has provided um, for uh, one of the communities that we work with is uh, resources for um, hiring staff to help fill those gaps in um, some of the stretched or, yeah, some of the thin staffing that uh, this community has as far as their wellness programs and clinical staffing. And so I think that, um, you know, through this, through the resources provided, they were they're working on uh, hiring staff to uh, take on this project, but also uh, different areas within the community. And so some of the results uh, so far, again, these are ongoing results and we still have a long way to go, but uh, super excited, but uh, let's see here. So uh, we conducted that workshop, as we mentioned, um, and we're working with two tribal entities. And so, um, within those tribal entities, there is a consortium of other tribes. And so um, working with them um, by providing an overview of the project and review evidence-based interventions for them to use and ongoing follow-up meetings uh, from early spring to establish baseline rates, identifying some of the, you know, some of the gaps in their, in their uh, data collection. But um, let's see here, as well as the scheduling of late, spring meetings with tribes to work on intervention plans. And so one of the other things that I, I like to um, bring to light is that a lot of the tribes here, or at least across Indian country, do not necessarily have efficient uh, electronic health records. You know, there are tribes that are still using uh, paper health records. And so looking at that and seeing how we can support those efforts, or at least um, strengthening those efforts in ways that would help um, identify some of their data collection um, strategies on some of the baseline of uh, baseline data on HPV vaccination, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. So, walking them through that process or um, identifying areas that would uh, essentially help them uh, identify those baseline numbers.
And as far as next steps, uh, continue to identify community strengths um, to develop those cancer activities with tribes. Uh, we want to utilize resources from the consortium and travel epidemiology centers for cancer screening and prevention activities uh, to implement into the community. And one of the things that I, I like to really stress is that we can't place the, the cancer activities that um, tribes are going to be used into one EDI box or one uh, evidence-based intervent or two, one to two intervention-based uh, intervention box. We have to recognize their sovereignty and recognize their self-determination um, to pull interventions and strategies from multiple uh, EBIs to develop cancer uh, activities that complement and work with tribal communities. I think that's uh, one of the main takeaways uh, from this project that we recognize as a, a research institution that you know we can we can continue to place evidence-based interventions that work for um, you know the general populations or specific communities uh, because you know essentially tribes are are sovereign nations and we are a political entity to um, that you know. Uh, political entities, uh, and so those processes are, are much different than working with uh, other communities. Thanks, Craig. And, and so in conclusion, uh, one of the things that we noted was that, uh, you know, the incidence and mortality of certain cancers among American Indian and Alaska Native groups uh, were uh, higher in comparison with non-Hispanic white populations. And um, we reached out to Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and they, of course, had been monitoring these for, you know, many years and um, were interested in talking with us about how to address those elevated rates. Um, and so using the CBPR approach, really offered an opportunity for us to learn a lot from them and all of the community work that they do with tribal communities in Washington State. And also we hope that um, it opens up some opportunities for Northwest Portland area and Indian Health Board and also the tribal partners that we're working with to access some resources and key supports that will help ensure that uh, we're able to partner and, and provide um, evidence-based interventions and other programming um, particularly within the context of this global pandemic uh, that will help support uh, improved healthcare access to screenings and vaccinations. Uh, we took an intergenerational approach and um, that was in line with uh, indigenous practices and, and kind of priorities within these tribal communities and also uh, with the support of Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and talking through, you know, what could work, what, how do we prioritize, and and what were some of the needs um, that are out there in the communities that, you know, that intergenerational approach could really support. Um, so it's been such a wonderful journey uh, over the last several months in developing the grant application um, in partnership with Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board um, in having those preliminary discussions that Craig mentioned with our tribal partners and um, getting the opportunity to work with um, them and, and the folks at Northwest Portland area and in Health Board has been such a great uh, process. Uh, and so we're really looking forward to, you know, the upcoming events that we're planning uh, for the summer. Um, and um, we hope that, you know, uh, those will be instrumental in ensuring that folks feel comfortable uh, to get the screening and also uh, to consider vaccination for HPV. Uh, it's been wonderful being here this morning. I know we have, or afternoon, <laughs> considering where you're at, uh, we have a little bit of time for some polling and also some questions. Um, so uh, thank you all so much. I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Dr. Parker, Mr. D, thank you so much. Um, it does look like we have some questions at the end. Um, because you can't not have a test. So we'll go ahead and go over those and everybody remind everybody that you can go to pollev.com slash UNCLCN to submit your answers. So for the first question, all TECs have comprehensive cancer control programs that are funded through the CDC. Is that true or false?
I don't think anybody wants to say true on that. Would that be correct? Correct. One person did. <laughs> All right, very good. The next question, indigenous communities have SDOH that are specific to their communities and contexts. And can you remind the audience what SDOH stands for? Social determinants of health. Okay. Thank you. And I would imagine that answer is also true. So they're doing well. I believe this is the last question. So tribal cultures offer unique opportunities for community engagement for cancer screening efforts. Very good. I would tend to guess this is also true. Everybody's doing great. So at this time, everybody can log in to pollev.com slash UNCLCN. You can submit your questions there. And Dr. Parker, Mr. D, I think that was a very important conversation. And I especially liked how you mentioned that public health is not just data collection. And that the second half of that is really the outreach, what you're doing. Um, I was also going to ask if there was any especially effective uh, forms of outreach that you enjoy doing. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned the postcard and the raffle. But is there anything else that's of special interest to either of you? I think for me, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think for me, as far as community engagement, is the, the use of storytelling. I think that uh, when being uh, within tribal communities or being uh, having a meeting with a, a tribal community member, and there there's always room for a story to be told, whether it be their story, a story from you know a colleague or a relative, or a story that comes from the community. And so, hearing those stories personalizes the the experience for me because. Um, that's the way I grew up, and storytelling is uh, a way to really engage with the community and uh, build that sort of trust relationship as well as the, uh, let's say, the, in the empathy for the community. Great. Thank you. And we do have some questions coming in as well. Um, the first one, can you speak to how EBIs have been adapted, shifted as a result of COVID-19? We can take that in, Craig, if you have anything, feel free to jump in. Um, well, you know, in, in the research world, of course, everything moves a lot sl more slowly. And so um, I think uh, we're still learning, you know, about some of the um, opportunities that uh, we have under pandemic conditions. So um, there are many tribal communities that have switched to telehealth, for example, and um, there are um, suggestions that that has been very effective in ensuring that continuity care um, and at the same time when you think about you know cancer screening that needs to be in person and so we've also seen as, as Craig mentioned earlier that um, the screening rates for many different types of cancer have have gone down during the pandemic you know especially over the last couple of years and so um, you know I think also that telehealth can only be um, effective in certain communities that have access to reliable phones and reliable internet um, and also devices that are internet ready and, and capable. And so um, those are maybe a couple of ways that um, EBIs have maybe shifted um, in the face of COVID-19. I think the other piece of course is that we've gotten a lot better at knowing how to protect people from COVID-19 infection. And so, uh, for example, in um, the partnerships that we're working in, uh, a lot of the events are going to be held outdoors to try to minimize possible infection. Uh, of course, everybody will um, have 
you know, masks on and, and taking other uh, measures to reduce the risk of infection, um, using hand sanitizer quite a bit, maybe even giving away some hand sanitizer, um, and also using uh, social distancing practices to ensure that folks are kept safe. Uh, as Craig mentioned earlier, COVID-19 has had a disproportionate effect on tribal communities and tribal populations. Their mort mortality rate has been significantly higher among many American Indian Alaska Native populations as compared to um, other populations in the United States. And, um, you know, all of us have been touched by it. Uh, we've lost family members and we've also had family members uh, who are still dealing with long COVID effects. Um, and so, um, you know, we don't want to have that happen as a result of, you know, us promoting cancer screening. Uh, cancer screening is certainly important. At the same time, we have to kind of balance the risks um, of, of doing something like that within communities. And so um, those are some of the, th the takeaways, I guess, from, from uh, what we've learned during the pandemic. Thank you. That's an especially good point that telemedicine is an excellent avenue, but it's not available to everyone. Um, next question, how challenging is it to prioritize which of the 29 tribes you work with? That is a very good question. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, it's the word pri prioritize. Um, I would want to be careful with this, but uh, with tribes, I think working with tribes, they we have to look at their priorities, um, seeing their priorities as far as working within their own communities. And so if cancer prevention is one of the priorities, then, you know, we, we connect with them and work with them. Um, and so... You know, there's 29 tribes. Essentially, you know, in a in a perfect world, that's 20 diff 29 different uh, MOUs, memorandums of understanding, or 29 different agreements. And so, um, you know, I think that partnering with uh, the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board sort of alleviates uh, some of those challenges because they already have that established um, trust and relationships with the tribes here in Washington State through their cancer control um, programming. And so. I think that working with them and um, seeing their perspective on some of the priority areas, or at least the areas that um, have been communicated by the tribes to them on uh, which cancer prevention activities or cancer initiatives or um, overall, um, yeah, I, I would say initiatives that they um, like to work on. Great, thank you. And then we have time for just a couple more. Um, this one, I'm particularly interested in the HPV vaccine communication. So it's great to see that as a focus of your work. Can you talk about specific components of the HPV vaccine interventions that have had to change to be more responsive to the needs of tribal communities? For example, different provider training, forms of communication, or messaging to families. Well, I think one of the things, you know, that we've seen is that um, it's important to ensure that uh, folks realize that HPV vaccines can help if they're applied across the population. So um, for many years, actually, it was uh, really targeting uh, women or uh, girls. Um, and so that's one piece where we need to make sure that folks know that all genders uh, should be um, vaccinated for HPV. Um, I think another piece is um, some of the research in Indian country shows that um, there's still some misunderstandings about HPV and its connection to the cervical cancer. And so it's important to provide that information and also provide the scaffolding and supports for providers uh, so that they can provide accurate information and also um, be able to translate that and make it uh, available to community members so that they can actually engage in those conversations with their children. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen in um, other work that I've done here in the, um, the King County urban Indian community is that parents maybe don't have the words to talk about HPV vaccination with their children. And, you know, that window when it's um, highly effective, you know, age, you know, 10 to, to 12 is, um, you know, very uh, vulnerable time for American Indian children. Uh, they're experiencing a lot in the schools. Um, parents may not be really ready or equipped to have conversations about sex and um, the risks from sex 
with children that young. And so uh, providing um, the support to parents and other caregivers, uh, maybe grandparents or aunts or uncles uh, who can have kind of conversations about those types of issues is really helpful for folks so that they have the words, you know, to and kind of the plan of kind of how to have those conversations with kids in a way that's supportive and meaningful and also addresses some of the fears, you know, that that folks have about um, cancer and shots um, and um, and also, you know, just going to see a healthcare provider. Very true. And the next question, we mentioned it briefly already with the reliable internet access. Um, you mentioned that online opportunities reduce the burden of tribal partners and tribal engagement. Do you find that reliable internet access is a burden for tribe members uh, that you're trying to engage in your experience? I think uh, what we've seen during the pandemic and, and even before the pandemic, that the tribes are making huge strides in terms of ensuring that tribal communities have access to the internet at the same time that infrastructure development doesn't happen overnight and uh, the resources are not always immediately available either. And so what we've seen is that, you know, folks are, are using it more and more um, and it's also a work in progress. And so we can't necessarily assume that everybody has the bandwidth um, that we have here in Seattle. And we need to make sure that there are other avenues for communicating opportunities and for providing educational resources. Um, and so a lot of folks still rely on paper um, or still rely on posters you know, within the community um, or postcards like Craig was mentioning earlier. And so we need to make sure that we're really um, providing the information and opportunities through a host of different avenues so that the folks that we want to um, access those and use them uh, are able to actually, you know, get, get that information. Very true. And I think we'll make this our last question. In balancing the positionality of being indigenous and a researcher, do you, do you how do you address past and current harms done to the American indigenous community by those in the healthcare field? Well, and Craig, please jump in. I know I've been talking a lot, um, but I guess, you know, I've thought a lot about this um, over the past 10 plus years since I got out of graduate school. And um, I think the most important piece is uh, really making sure that I'm being transparent and we're having conversations about those harms on a regular basis. Uh, one of the things that has come up recently is that uh, we're all carrying trauma uh, whether it's historical trauma or, you know, it's trauma related to maybe um, experiences that we've had with health providers. Uh, and that informs how we perceive information and um, educational pieces that come out of evidence-based interventions, for example. And so um, addressing that trauma is really important because if we don't, then uh, we're still you know, basically kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing if it sticks or not. Um, and what we really need to do is remove the wall, right? And make sure that, you know, everybody is able to access this information and they're able to do it in a safe way where they feel like they're being heard and um, they're able to understand what their um, opportunities are to ensure their safety and to also feel supported in the decision that they make, whether it's to go ahead and get screened or whether it's to um, continue to think about it and um, consult with medical providers or, you know, take other avenues. And so I think um, the big thing is to, to really have the space and hold that space for others to have those kinds of conversations. And uh, for me, I think that, uh, you know, essentially when I look at that question, I, look, I, I think about myself walking into different worlds, walking in an academic and Western perspective, but also walking uh, alongside the community, indigenous community. And so, um, you know, looking at my self-reflection, you know, how do I work with, um, you know, some of the communities that, um, that, uh, that we connect with but at the same time, how do we do it in a good way? Um, how do we do that in, in a way that respects many things that haven't been um, looked at before, such as tribal sovereignty, culture, humility, uh, self-determination, thinking of those things 
and uh, looking at how those things can empower the community, but also empower the, the science behind the research that we're trying to um, conduct or at least uh, work with tribes on. And so I think that there's a lot of education that needs to be done on the Western perspective of things and seeing how the, some of those traumas, like Mar Myram has mentioned, are still ongoing. And so uh, helping the, the Western uh, perspective or at least the Western world uh, see those traumas and how do we take that trauma-informed approach to um, work with the indigenous communities. Thank you both. That was such a powerful note to end on. Thank you both so much. You've given us a lot to reflect on today um, and really appreciate sharing your personal experiences and the challenge to all of us to do a lot of self-reflection. Um, this has been really moving and, and very informative. Um, on behalf of everyone here at SciStep, I want to say thank you. We really appreciate you sharing space and time with us today. And we hope that you all will come back and join us um, on November 9th for Dr. Don Warney, who's um, going to be our next SciStep speaker. Um, this coincides nicely with American Indian Heritage Month, and um, we would really like to grow this community. Thank you both again. Great, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And just to close up the webinar, um, if you enjoyed this presentation, we do have other courses available with the SciSEP series that are, are self-paced online courses. Um, if you go directly to learn.unclcn.org slash SciSEP dash SPOX, which stands for our self-paced online courses, um, you can take a look at some of the previous presenters we've had. This one will also be available around June that you can view and take an assessment. And then our other upcoming live webinars, um, we have several um, upcoming, the Patient-Centered Care on May 11th at 12, our Advanced Practice Provider Series on May 18th, and another Patient-Centered Care on June 8th. And with that, I want to thank everyone so much for attending. If you had any issues with today's presentation, please give us a call or email at that link there. And otherwise, thank you, Dr. Parker and Mr. D, very much for joining, and Dr. Wheeler. <laughs>